Thank you very much, Matt. Okay. So we arrived at this continuum theory, rho dot equals minus k minus lambda rho plus lambda rho squared plus d del squared rho plus noise. And noise has this kernel. So Gaussian noise, some gamma, which is actually lambda plus k, rho, crucially here, Delft constant, so white noise in space and time. <clears throat> so k was the death rate and lambda is the splitting rate. And this nonlinear term is because you can only split if there's an empty neighbor beside you. So um, what we're going to do now is mean field theory. That really should be two words, I guess. Uh, and then Gaussian model. And this will be the theory which is correct above four dimensions. So we suppress the noise first at the mean field level. Forget about the noise. And look for a homogeneous solution. In a stationary state, so homogeneous stationary. So this is what mean field theory consists of. You just say there's some average uh, density. So you can solve this in steady state. Uh, that's zero, this equals that. So you have rho steady state equals lambda minus kappa over lambda. And this vanishes linearly as lambda tends to the critical value, lambda c, which is equal to kappa at this level. So I'm only interested in lambda bigger than lambda c, but as I approach lambda c, which is kappa, this density falls linearly to zero. Um, so rho steady state asymptotically is like lambda minus lambda c to the power one. And that's the same as saying in mean field theory, the exponent beta, which I defined last time, is equal to one. So that's the, the mean field theory. Um, and I could say a little bit more about it, but let's just go straight on. Because the next step uh, is to linearize about that. So about a state of uniform density, which I'm now going to call rho bar, but that's the same as rho steady state. And this is positive. Uh, but I'm going to restore the noise now. And this whole question about four dimensions and so on is basically to do with whether the noise comes to dominate or not. So I'm going to notate it like this. I'm going to write rho equals rho bar plus var phi. Hope you can distinguish those two letters. Uh, they'll merge again in a minute, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, so what I have here, if, uh, if I think about the mean field equation without the noise, I've, this is my density. There's rho bar here, and it's stable from either direction. That's basically what those first two terms are, are telling you. So um, I'm going to have a, a, some kind of you know, potential confining me around here, and I put noise in, and I see what the statistics of the fluctuations are. So make that substitution in the top equation, and you get the linearized equation for this difference here. And I'm going to introduce an object delta. There's still the diffusion, and there's now the noise term. And uh, here, because I'm linearizing it, the noise correlator has rho bar in it. So this has got rid of the multiplicative noise as part of the linearization. And this then is a completely solvable uh, problem. Here, delta is basically the same thing as uh, rho bar, it's defined as lambda minus k over lambda. That's the thing which you actually get in this position if you do the linearization. Um, and that equals rho steady state, proportional to lambda minus lambda c. Um, in general, it's the distance from the tra transition. Uh, 
which at this simple level is the same as the actual density, but it's the distance from the transition is what matters about it. Okay, so Fourier transform this. And once I've Fourier transformed, I can go back to that notation because these things only differ at Q equals zero. So I have rho dot of Q of T equals minus delta rho Q minus D Q squared rho Q plus that noise. Um, so these two terms are making this decay and that is keeping it alive. So the fluctuations are being pumped up by the noise and are just decaying in time. So this is a linear equation with linear non-multiplicative noise, so we can solve it. Rho Q of T is this integral, minus infinity to T, exponential minus delta plus V Q squared, T minus T prime, noise, for a component Q of T prime, V T prime. So I can think of this as I'm driving the system with this random noise, and the noise decays with the decay rate set by this. And I just add it all up over the whole infinite temporal history of that system. Uh, so both sides are Gaussian distributed. This is, you know, all from linearization. That's Gaussian. So this is Gaussian. Um, and I can calculate its covariance matrix. Uh, I just basically put two of these side by side and do the average there, but I won't go through that step. Rho Q. T rho Q star, and let's put a prime here so that like, these um, could be different Qs in principle, but I get a Kronecker delta anyway between the two Qs. And gamma rho bar over delta plus D Q squared exponential minus delta plus D Q squared mod T minus T prime. So that's the result of basically essentially squaring that equation and averaging it. Sorry? A half. Yes, I've not been careful about halves. So let's just put this here. Is that all right? Where? I don't think there's any other halves around, are there? I'm not quite sure, but anyway, I think that's that's basically whether there's a numerical factor multiplying this, which I've just swerved. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Um, well, they're not linear. At, 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 at this point, uh, <clears throat> this is the definition of the of the of the Gaussian model, um, and I say the key thing is it will work in high dimensions. So let's look at this first at equal time. So S of Q, which is the normal name for the structure factor. So at equal time, this is rho Q, rho Q star, average, and this is a function of Q. C perp, and this is the definition of that um, correlation length there. So basically, this is my function. So I know everything about it. And that allows me to say that C perp is D over delta square root, because the Q dependence is here. So you can see this is a function of D Q squared over delta. This looks like delta to the minus of half. And that says that the mean field value of new perp, which was defined in terms of how this blows up as I approach the transition, is a half. So we have beta from mean field theory, and this, which is the kind of augmented mean field theory known as the Gaussian model, is giving me that. Um, and also, if I look at this at delta equals zero plus, so on approaching the transition, 
uh, then at low Q, S of Q looks like Q to the minus two. So I cover this up and I just see my Q to the minus two sitting here. There's no other Q dependence in this expression. Yep. I'm just expanding in fluctuations. That's all, I've just assumed the fluctuations are small enough that I can linearize the dynamics completely start to finish. That's all. Um, gamma, but I mean, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens to this. I mean, the, the, the fact is that this will, will work above four dimensions for reasons I will explain. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I've got, um, I had beta equals one already. There's the half for this new, there's zero for, that exponent was the one defined from S of Q. It's the one with the plus eta here. So in general, there's a plus eta and that vanishes at this level for the Gaussian model. And then all I have to do just to fit, because I, I said last time that you only need three or four of these exponents to fix all the others. Um, so let's just finish the job. Um, so if I look at unequal time, well, you can see that exponential factor, all the time dependence is up in there. So S Q goes to naught plus D T prime looks like P to the minus delta times T minus T prime. Uh, and this is a function of T minus T prime over C parallel. This was the scaling uh, statement that I made when defining these exponents before. Uh, and so that means that C parallel is basically one over delta. And that means that the mean field value of this exponent describing the parallel correlation, I call the time-like correlations, uh, is one. Okay, so if I linearize everything, I get this set of exponents from which I can calculate any other exponents that I might be interested in. And the question is, uh, when is this linearization okay? And the answer to that question is uh, addressed by looking at something called the Ginzburg criterion. which is, um, was originally developed for equilibrium transitions, but is equally applicable here. So um, I'm, I've got rho bar, which is rho steady state, is proportional to delta to the first power, that's my beta equals one, and that's basically proportional to lambda minus lambda c. So these are all things I've just told you. So what we look at now, this, rho of r minus rho bar, squared average. So this is the variance in the density at a point R, and this can be any random point, any place. System is translation invariant, so I can choose this place wherever I want. And this is proportional to this integral. So A, if you remember, was my uh, lattice parameter or cutoff, zero, S of Q, D and Q. And the reason for this is Parseval's theorem. Uh, which is basically integral row squared, well, mod row squared in general, but row is real, so there's an optional DDR equals V integral row Q mod squared D DQ. So this is just a statement, doesn't even require these to be random variables, that's just a statement about Fourier transforms. Um, so if I average that, this, this uh, V is soaked up here somewhere. The point is that I can choose any place, and I look at the, the, on the local fluctuations in density, and they're given by an integral of recipe. Right. <clears throat> uh, 
Now we're interested in what is happening or uh, uh, close to the critical point, and uh, the, the 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 part of S of Q that we're interested in is the low Q behavior, so the large distance behavior. And I'm going to be slightly cavalier about this, which is traditional in this field. Um, I'm just interested in the way that average or that variance there, that local variance, uh, behaves as I get close to the transition point. And the question will be, is it large or small compared to the square of the mean? So interested in the contribution. Low Q contribution. So the, the problem is with the, the SQ that I've chosen, that actually is divergent at the top end. That's not of interest to us because there's always a cutoff. It's also can be, as delta goes to zero, as we'll see in a second, it's divergent at the bottom end. That's interesting because it says that the, there are long wavelength fluctuations which are, are contributing to the local variance in the density in a way that I can calculate. So I want to isolate these. I have basically this integral, gamma rho var over delta plus dq squared. So this was my S of Q at equal time, dbq. And I can estimate that, or I can do this much more formally if you want, but it's basically this. So the low Q part of this is saying, well, at low Q, small enough Q, if delta is not zero, I have this. I integrate it up to the point where these two terms are equal, which is there. And I have this one over delta, which is the key feature here. So this looks like gamma rho bar over delta C per to the minus D. So actually that's really the key feature. Um, so rho bar is proportional to delta. That was my beta equals one calculation just now. Um, so this is proportional to C per to the minus D. And that in turn is proportional to rho bar to the D over two. So this is because rho bar goes like delta and C uh, goes like delta to the minus one. Right, so the conclusion. Rho of R minus rho bar squared is proportional to rho bar D over two. So, one can ask, is this fluctuation small compared to the mean? It's quite graphic in this situation because rho bar is the mean density. And if the fluctuations take me to negative density, I'm in deep trouble because the density is positive. So, um, so let's state it in those terms. But rho is greater than zero everywhere or equal to. So this means that this construction, the Gaussian model, Okay, if so, rho bar to the d over two, which is this rho minus rho bar squared average, has to be little o of rho bar squared as rho bar goes to zero. In other words, for this to work, the fluctuations have to be vanishingly small on the scale of the mean density as I take the mean density to zero. Otherwise, I'm going to get negative densities, and clearly the theory has not worked. You might say, well, is this sufficient? And I don't want to get into that, but this is actually the same condition as saying, are the fluctuations within the linear regime of the original theory? Where? I'm estimating this integral. So this is what happens here. Delta is very small. So at low Q, this is an extremely large integral. And it's extremely large until Q squared is bigger than delta over D. And that basically cuts off this part of the integral. So that's what I put here. So I'm estimating this thing by saying it has its Q equals zero value up to a, a Q at which the denominator starts to change. And that's this place because C perp is delta over D square root.
Big D. Um, well, it appears here. No, no, I mean, it's um, well, you, uh, this. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, well, okay. So uh, it doesn't appear, you're right. But I mean, it sort of lives in here somewhere. Well, I, I have to find Xipa. No, I, I defined Xipa a whole lecture ago, and I and I calculated as it. I calculated the R. Ah, well, sorry. No, 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 no. That that explains. So excuse my impatience with your question. Uh, this I actually in during this lecture, I showed this result. So that D does live here, and D lives inside there. If you want. So it affects the correlation length, uh, but by the time I'm looking at this quantity, there's no need for D anymore. Right. Okay, so this condition here is where my D equals four. So this happens a lot in statistical physics. You have a, 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 a model which has fluctuations. You look at the fluctuations at linear level and you ask, are they small enough that the linear level is okay? Uh, and the way this pans out for this particular model is four dimensions. There, 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 there are many other models for which that's also true. But by the way, for undirected percolation, uh, you need to have D bigger than six at this point, but that's not. I'm just saying DC isn't always four for every every universality class. Anyway, DC equals four is the upper critical dimension. And for D, greater than DC, mean field theory plus the Gaussian fluctuations. Gives all the exponents correctly. And that's basically because the fluctuations are perturbative to a problem that I can solve, which was the mean field thing. Right, chapter seven. Results for D less than DC. So there are some uh, stochastic differential equations like this for which there are exact results, for instance, in one dimension, for instance, a famous one called the KPZ equation. But for this universality class, there aren't any. Which is partly why uh, physics people have been obsessing about it for years. On the other hand, you can smash this problem with numerics if you want to. So I don't want to, you know, dwell too long on this. But let me, let me just tell you. So I'm just going to plot a table of some exponents here. D greater than 4, D equals 3, 2, 1. Exponents beta, new parallel, new perp, Sorry, other way around. Uh, I'll also just include the fractal dimension because that's of interest uh, to, if you just want to think about this, this, the set of points where the system is alive. So we have these values, one, half, one, two, from the Gaussian model. Um, D equals, I'm going to give these to one decimal. Wait, 8.6.3. In fact, though, they're known to about four decimals. 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 1.1, 1.1, 1.3, 1.7, 2 there, 1.7, 1.2, 0 0.75. So for instance, in one dimension, the fractal dimension, so the set of occupied points in 1D is a fractal, like a Cantor set type of object with dimension about 0.75. Uh, 
So as I say, these are known this way, the four digits. Um, and there are also various bespoke, so shall we say specific approximation schemes. Uh, which are, you know, for instance, in, in 1D, if you go back to the original contact process, you can think of clever approximations that allow you to get an, a handle on the uh, the exponents. Um, but I don't want to talk about any of those uh, DP specific things. I want to talk about the general framework for thinking about these exponents and indeed calculating them, which is the normalization group which many of you will know about. So good time for questions. Yeah. Yes, I did. Uh, D equals four. In D equals four, the integral is logarithmically diverging. And in fact, you don't have exponents. You have logs, everywhere logs. So you get things like uh, the, 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 the correlation length goes like the log of, the, of lambda minus lambda c to a power. So the d equals four is special. And actually in the normalization group, what happens is these logs get gathered in a specific way to give you exponents in less than four dimensions or estimate them at least. But that's a good question. I did leave that off. So you can think of those logarithmically disturbed from those one half, one, two values. So many of you will know about the normalization group, but I, I want to kind of target this a bit to people who don't, because I think in this kind of uh, setting, it's a, it's a good thing to at least have a conceptual grasp of it, even if you never want to do a calculation. Okay. And I advise you never to do a calculation unless you have a good reason to. So RG is it's usually called. It's a misnomer. It's not a group. It's a semi-group. Um, anyway, that's what it was called, and that's what... Wilson got his Nobel Prize for in about 1970. So a generic approach. So what we do is we prune, prune the spatial degrees of freedom. Then we do a kind of rescaling, which we can think of as a zoom out. to restore previous resolution, the resolution being set by the cutoff. So I can think of this as restoring the cutoff. And in this step, I do some rescaling like this. Uh, B is less than one. And I also rescale the field. This is important. And in general, there's a B to the U here times row. Um, and note what happens here. If I have a system which is close to the critical point, and I somehow, you know, do a coarse graining, which say eliminates half of its degrees of freedom. And then I do this. If the correlation length is finite, it has shrunk because B is less than one. So this is important. Note C parallel, which is the correlation length in space, has shrunk if it's not infinite. This is crucial because at the critical point, it is infinite. So if I do this at the critical point, and I do it right, nothing happens. So the point is that these steps, when you know implemented in a specific way, uh, define a map. So this is what the normalization group is all about. And it's a map in the space of parameters of the model, parameters like k, lambda, d, gamma, et cetera. And the critical point is a fixed point of this map. Because if the correlation length is infinite and also the system size is infinite, this procedure of coarse graining out some degrees of freedom and then basically uh, shrinking the system maps the system onto itself. And that's because 
the main effect of that procedure is to shrink the correlation length, and if it's infinite, it stays where it is. Okay, and the other thing which I shall squeeze in on the bottom here is that the exponents are eigenvalues of the linearized map at the fixed point. So this is important. It says that the exponents are things I can talk about. I can try to measure them and so on. But what they actually are is they have this deep structure connected with how the system behaves on uh, coarse graining and rescaling. And uh, two systems which maybe have different initial equations of motion, if they go to the same fixed point, they will have the same exponents. So, and I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate that a little bit more in a minute. Okay. So briefly, there are two flavors. The first one can be done in real space, and I will definitely not do it. So for example, I could imagine starting with my contact process and I could eliminate alternate sites. So for instance, I'd look at a pair of sites, and if either of them is occupied, I say the coarse grain site is occupied. Uh, so that would is, give me b equal to half. Um, and the problem with this is it's completely ad hoc. Because what happens if I do that, the interaction between these coarse grain sites includes piece terms which are not in my original model. I get a proliferation of terms which basically give me more and more complicated interactions between more and more distant sites. And I just, in the real space for normalization, what you actually do is just, you just cross them all out as they appear, uh, which is grotesquely ad hoc. Uh, it is basically, therefore, I would say, a pedagogical interest in lecture courses on the renormalization group, where you will often hear several lectures about it. The grown-up version is using field theory, which some of you will have seen either you know, directly or because uh, there are theories of turbulence uh, which look exactly like this from Brakenham, Sam Edwards, uh, David McComb, et cetera. Integrate over a thin shell in Fourier space. And this shell is near the cutoff. So uh, the shell is Q max over b uh, times b, I think, actually. b is less than 1. Yeah, q max b to q max. And by thin, I mean b equals 1 minus an infinitesimal. So this is like a continuous version of this coarse graining. And this is what allows me over here to define this map as a smooth map rather than some kind of discrete jumping around in parameter space which is important. So this is now a differential map. At least can stay in the parameter space. If I choose that parameter space to be reasonably big, but not, you know, ludicrous. And also it can be explicitly constructed. V equals DC minus epsilon. So I have to first think about analytically my, continuing my whole theory to non-integer dimensions, which is not actually that unusual in field theory. Um, and I work close to the upper group dimension. So for us, that means close to 4D. And the result of doing this, which I'm definitely not going to do. But well, the results are exponents found from the eigenvalues of the linearization of this map. And they are expressed as asymptotic series. 
in epsilon and beta equals one minus epsilon over six is what you find plus, and I won't write the next order, new perp is a half plus epsilon over 16, new parallel is one plus epsilon over 12 and um, results to order epsilon cubed are available. They are pretty hard work. These only actually came out last year. Epsilon squared has been around for a decade or two. Um, so just in case you are wondering about it, these must be asymptotic because for negative epsilon, there is no correction. So the, the radius of convergence of this expansion must be zero. That doesn't mean it's not useful. And in fact, if you do go to order epsilon cubed, you get certainly to this accuracy in most of these cases and sometimes better. Okay. But there's something more important than the exponents when you look at life this way. And that's the existence of this map and what it says about universes. I guess we've got a B there, so let's call a C. The normalization group explains universality. So let's go back to the original equation. And um, just to fit with notation that it's from major, if I was going to do this thoroughly, I would make use of this. But I'm going to put a tau here. Um, so I'm just putting a, 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 a Time parameter on the right hand side just makes life a little bit easier. I've got k rho minus lambda rho squared plus d del squared rho plus c, and there could be other terms. Example mu mn grad to the nth power rho to the nth power. So these are of this type, but I've only got three of them. And you can say, well, I can have infinitely many terms here. Uh, what's going on? What happens is that those all disappear at the fixed point of this map. So um, let me just remind you, I also need to specify what the noise is. Right. So what I have is in the, and this defines a parameter space, which can be in principle, very high dimensional because there could be all these other terms in a particular model that uh, is actually ends up being in this class. There could be all kinds of other terms in that equation in principle. What happens is I have something called the critical manifold. Which is the set of initial parameters that correspond to C per equals infinity. And those are the set of initial parameters which are at the critical point. So here's this manifold. And I'm afraid I can only draw it in two dimensions. And within this manifold, now I'm drawing the arrows here. And let me explain the directions of these arrows. So what the RG was doing, um, I constructed the map for decreasing correlation length. Each time I apply the normalization group, the correlation length shrinks. If I want to know what's happening to the system, uh, the, 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 the uh, critical point, it's more useful to just think about it in the other direction and say, how does the system approach the critical point? And it has all these parameters. And if you're in the critical manifold, that's the set of initial parameters that are critical and they end up here under coarse graining at a set of fixed point values, which I can think of as k star. Um, I will not put k star there yet. I'll put lambda star, d star. These are some of my parameters, but there's also any number of others. These are fixed point values. Yeah. 
Huh. Good question. I think I think um, I think it is generally simple. I think the the usually the um, the dependence the, the question of whether your whether your values are critical as is, is, it should be smoothly dependent on the initial parameters. That probably is assumed somewhere. Uh, but this fixed point can also have unstable directions, which are taking off the critical surface. So here's one, and this is the same thing going in the opposite direction. And an example of a parameter which does that is this one, K. And in fact, it's the only one in the Gaussian model. <clears throat> um, right. So I could put K here as well. So there is a fixed point in K, but it's unstable. So if I put K star at the beginning of this list, this the fixed point value of k is zero and unstable. I can have a bunch of things which have finite fixed points, and some of them will not even flow, but this is a, this is a, 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 a tiny detail. The important thing is that these ones uh, are zero at the fixed point and stable. So what that means is in the neighborhood of the critical point, if I start with the DP equation here and I perturb it with some arbitrary perturbation, then if I zoom out and ask what's happening in the critical region, that disappears. OK. So these things here are irrelevant. And this statement about them is what the word irrelevant means in the renormalization group. It says there are coupling or there are, there are coefficients that I could have in my original model that flow to zero as I approach the critical point if I think of this map in terms of how the system parameters evolve on coarse graining, and therefore they have no effect. Um, so in almost all cases, and I left the almost there, for a reason which I won't go into, these cannot change the critical exponents. They have their own exponents, actually. Sorry? MN, coefficient of this. Well, you don't have to try them. I mean, okay, I, I, can, I could tack this on at the end if you want, but... Yeah, no, so, so apart from that, here is, this is um, m equals 0, n equals 1. This is m equals 0, n equals 2. This is m equals 2, n equals 1. And what I'm saying is that all of the other things that we could put here in a DP equation vanish at the critical point. You have to worry about things like grad rho, but grad rho you can't have in the equation for the time dependence of a scalar because of the metric. So 1, 1 is not here for symmetry reasons. If it was, it would wreck everything. But that's so what it means, though, if I just look, so what it means is that, in principle, the 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 the, 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 the what what happens in good cases, including this one, close to four dimensions. That's where this is all known to be true. Is that the uh, the theory has a limited number of relevant parameters. It may have some which are marginal, which don't flow, actually d happens to be an example. Um, and then it has a bunch of parameters which vanish at the critical point. Now, the, the, the unstable direction k, if you remember, uh, lambda, which state way did I have it? Doesn't matter. The, 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 the unstable direction, it tells you that if I have a small value of this, I'm going away from criticality. And the power law with which I go away from criticality tells me exponents like beta. These, the, uh, uh, so you have a, a, a positive and negative eigenvalues of this map. And the way I've defined it, the positive eigenvalues are relevant and they appear in the critical exponents. The negative eigenvalues are telling you about the vanishing of irrelevant terms in this equation. 
And you can ask about those power laws. They are actually proper critical exponents. It's just that it's rather rarely do you want to know about them. Sorry? Well, I have it written down here. It's on one page, and I may or may not have time for it. No, no, it, 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 I mean, this is a very easy calculation, uh, but in, a, in a specific sense that I will, I will actually try to explain next. So, <clears throat> um, so, I mean, a lot of things I've just said, by the way, I've said with, you know, unerring confidence. And to be honest, what we know is that they're true close to four dimensions. Because what we everything we know about this map, we know only close to four dimensions. Or above. Uh, the case that I have in my one page is above four dimensions, which is the Gaussian model. And in the Gaussian model, you can ask about these, these terms. And you can do this um, prune and zoom procedure. And all those terms that I've mentioned go to zero at the Gaussian fixed point. So uh, if... If there is time later, that's the case I, I would be happy to go through. Outcomes. So K is relevant. So the fixed point has an unstable direction. And all that means is that most systems are not critical. A general, if I put random parameters in that equation, I'm not at the critical point. And the RG flow will not take me to the critical point. If I coarse grain, I'll find correlation length, which began finite, shrinks to zero. So that means I must fine tune something to reach the critical point. So in epidemics, say, K is. What R, R number minus one, I think I've got the sign right, in your pipe flow, assuming that this whole picture is roughly appropriate for it, K becomes Reynolds minus Reynolds critical, etc. So there always is a variable which needs to be dialed to find the critical point. Okay, next comment. D greater than DC equals four, nonlinearity. is irrelevant. And I actually just did solve the Gaussian model. Uh, and what I told you that the, the fluctuations stay small above uh, four dimensions. I can think of that in two ways, by the way. If I take the Gaussian model, which is linear plus fluctuations, um, the, the, I, I can either think about what's happening on the scale of the fluctuations or what's happening on the scale of the mean. Uh, I maybe will come back to that, but probably not. So that was an aside. Um, what this means, though, is lambda, which is the nonlinear term there, goes to zero, decreases under the flow towards the fixed point. Uh, the noise, by the way, is marginal. And so what that means is that if I start with that theory with some finite gamma for my noise, and I do this renormalization group, which means I, I constantly rescale. And I look at the place where the zoom and prune procedure doesn't change the behavior because the correlation length is infinite, and so it cannot shrink. Lambda goes to zero above four dimensions. So that means that I have in, above four dimensions something called the Gaussian fixed point. So I can draw this, and I've got various other directions as well, but the important things that matter are k and lambda. So I've said that this fixed point is unstable in k. So the flow looks like this. But above four dimensions, it's stable in lambda. In other words, lambda goes to zero. 
So I can just complete this drawing with some flow curves like that. So that's what the Gaussian fixed point is. It works above four dimensions and it gives you this uh, appealingly simple linear theory as the source of everything you need to know. So what happens then in D equals four minus epsilon? Well, if I plot it like this, and this is K, so this is still unstable, it always is. What happens is, but that now this is gonna be uh, relevant. Lambda will take me away from the Gaussian fixed point the nonlinearity matters because the fluctuations are large enough to care about it. That's what the, the Landau Ginsberg, the Ginsberg criterion told me. So what I have now is something like this. And this means there's a second fixed point here, uh, which will have a flow like that. So this is a new fixed point. And in equilibrium critical phenomena, it's called the Wilson Fisher fixed point. Well, we may as well call it that here as well. Though it's not necessarily its name. And at this point, which is this is lambda, so the coordinates of this point, lambda star and k star, are order epsilon, and can be computed to order epsilon. And basically, because this fixed point is if epsilon is taken to be small, this fixed point is close to the Gaussian one in a, a sense which you can probably grasp, but is actually very difficult to define. Um, what that means is that the other terms I talked about, like the mu mn ones, so the other terms that were irrelevant still are. But there is a big caveat there. Some might become relevant. Finitely away from four dimensions, so for d less than dc prime, which is less than dt. Okay. So that's how the renormalization group works. And the, 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 the key thing then is the idea you have in principle, an unlimited space of models, but because as, as a, a generic feature of critical points is that the uh, linearized map near the critical point has a large number of irrelevant directions, so negative eigenvalues and a small number of positive ones, that you can start anywhere in this enormous space of theories and still end up at the same critical model. And that's the sense in which DP is a universality class. Right, so um, I have a short time left. Um, so two options. One is to say a bit more about some of the cases I discussed last time, which break DP. Another possible option is to run through the RG for the Gaussian fixed point. Uh, my feeling is to do the first of those. And if anyone really wants to see the second, firstly, it's in textbooks, but also I could do it just at the end. Uh, I haven't allowed the rest of you to light me. Although it is instructive, and it's something that if you've not seen, you should see at some point. Right, so let's then talk about variants. So things which are not in this universality class. So what this says, is that I can't. Yes, please. Well, they're both zero at the Gaussian fixed point. And they're both of order epsilon. One of them, you could have one of them order epsilon squared. Yep. I may have misremembered. Yep. Okay, so uh, you may, maybe it's possible that this one is order epsilon squared. Oh, why would you expect that? Okay, good. Then I'm very happy to accept correction on that. So, uh, how shall I correct myself? No. 
but I mean, it, so then, so there's two things in the normalization group. One is the 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 deep and really important thing is the uh, sense of relevant and irrelevant variables and fixed points of this map. That's what the Nobel Prize was for in 1970. The clever technical trick is to turn that into an expansion in four minus d for the exponents. So first was Wilson, second was Wilson and Fisher, and Wilson got the Pro Nobel Prize without sharing it with Fisher. So it's clear that they agreed with me as to which was the totally innovative step, and that's the first one. Okay. Mind you, a lot of people think that that was very unfair to Michael Fisher. So, uh, yeah, well, of course, the whole, the, the, the reason that Wilson was able to do anything about this was this whole idea of the scaling laws and the idea of, you know, the, the, the critical point being uh, special and developing power laws had been evolving for 15 or 20 years beforehand. But still, I don't, I mean, well, it is known that Kadanoff was not about to do what Wilson did. Right. So escape from DP. So I did mention this one last time, but I think it's worth spending a few minutes on it because it's it's quite interesting. So reaction diffusion. With an even increment in the number of particles. Uh, again, with an absorbing state. So example. A goes to 3A, 2A goes to 0. Um, and in this case, I can exclude this, although that doesn't actually matter so much. But anyway, this thing, it's important that this cannot spontaneously die. So this is called parity conserving. And the name of this is PC. That's the name of the universality class for this type of model. So the dynamics conserves whether the number of particles is even or odd. And a question I did ask last time um, So, well, firstly, even goes to empty. Odd goes to one particle. And they're both absorbing states. So I have two absorbing states. And the thing which is perhaps mysterious about that is you think, well, you're only going to find out about this when there's only one or two particles left in the entire system. And how could it possibly care in terms of all this stuff about scaling laws and critical exponents and fractals and stuff? But there's a reason. And that's because um, the whole character of the continuous, of the, of the critical behavior any critical behavior is that the the critical state is you know infecting the, the the neighboring region of parameter space. So let me say a bit about that. So it's five o'clock now, and uh, if you don't mind, I'll just finish this. Just take a few minutes, and I'll. Uh, So how can it matter, especially given that any in initial condition has only one? I mean, the initial number of particles is either even or it's odd. And so there seems to be only one absorbing state in any particular starting point because the odd evenness is conserved. Well, so the answer is the approach to that state, which is the critical behavior. It's effective. So let me just say why this is. So directed percolation, I said it was a fractal. It is. This is what the state looks like close to criticality. I have some intermittent thing. So I have large gaps between clusters. 
and these are clusters only in the sense of being uh, nearby particles. So let's call these live clusters. And this whole thing is fractal. So these, the fact that this has got these big fluctuations in it is what gives me critical fluctuation. And if I look at the density-density correlator, so in Fourier space, S cubed is like Q to the minus two plus eta, so it's diverging, and eta is about 0 0.3 in one dimension. So what does PC do? It's totally different. What happens here is close to the point where there's nothing left, what I have is large gaps between what I'm going to call zombie singlets or short-lived three, five, seven. So uh, if I say trace one of these in time, so I'm now making this the t-direction, what I see is this, okay, I mean, you can split into three and uh, it can go like any odd number actually, so I might end up with you know, five a bit, but then it's, going, it's basically going to make a bubble and then it's going to collapse back down to one. And then only when it reaches another one, again, decorated in this way, can it disappear. Whereas uh, any of these things can disappear at any time. So if you think about that, what that means is that if I'm very close to critical points, so I'm very close to the end. You know, this, this system is nearly dead. Actually, these spaces are unusually uniform because the 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 if there are two sites which are nearby two odd clusters in close proximity will meet they'll make an even cluster which will die so that's why it really matters what uh, what is happening here so i have weak density fluctuations in the sense of being unusually evenly spaced minus two plus eta is actually either zero or positive, and I think it's zero in D equals one. Uh, not completely sure about that. Okay, so then just lastly, I can you know create a field theory of this process. and you know, ask what the relevant terms are, etc. And this is a bit fraught. It's actually quite difficult in low dimensions, but it, 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 what, like, what we can do is go this far. For this process, PC, uh, the upper critical dimension is two. So the Gaussian model works down in and past three dimensions. And uh, one of the reasons, so let me just say this, is that if I think about the noise, it's got this structure, rho squared, delta, delta. So I had rho here before, uh, which was basically the noise coming from the difference of branching and decay. But now I can only annihilate in pairs. And if I branch, I'm going to create two. The lowest order contribution to the noise ends up involving two particles, hence rho squared. That's already enough to change everything. <clears throat> and so um, I'm going to leave it as an exercise, which is to show DC equals two via the Ginsburg criterion. Extremely simple. Just repeat exactly what I did before with a row squared here, and you'll get, get it straight away. Okay, so um, it's five past five. That seems like a good place to stop, and so I'm going to stop. Thank you. Any more questions? Of course, welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If I draw the panel is tapped, yes. Then I have to embarrass the question. What does B equal four and greater than four dimensions actually mean? Well, it means a Euclidean space. Uh, in well, okay. You, you, I mean, four is fine, surely. Five is fine. The problem is the analytic continuation to continuous D. So, um, yeah. So then. So 
Um, the normalization group kind of started in quantum field theory as opposed to statistical field theory. And there actually you do have a lot of quite firm handles on analyticity. So you have to think of the whole thing as an analytic continuation from the integers to a continuous B. And that analytic continuation you know, is at the level of diagrammatic perturbation theory, essentially. So that's where this lives. And it's, it's associated with concepts like renormalizability and so on. So uh, there's, there's, you know, there's a, it, it's not as ad hoc as it's bound to look when you see it for the first time. But I mean, it is does take a bit of getting used to. Yeah. I mean, and just an interesting comment from my side of the fence, as it were, that all the dull stuff that analysts do with now the Stokes analysis and sublet spaces, and they work in integer dimensions one, two, three, and everything fails at four. Mm. It just doesn't, none of it works. Well, I did mention Martin Hira last time. Yeah. And um, my instinct is kind of maybe to do with that. In other words, well, I'm yeah, no, no, okay, that's, that's not fair because he obviously what he was doing is purely for stochastic PDEs. So, uh, with stochastic PDEs, the the fact that the equation doesn't really exist until you say precisely what you mean by it, which I have definitely not done, um, is kind of very stark. And it may be that even without the noise, you have similar problems at some point. Mm. Yeah. How Renormalization for fluid turbulence, you get some benefits from Galilei and Nervous. So one of the coefficients can't be played with. Does that enter this game? Uh, it, that, things like that definitely do enter this game. Um, and I didn't talk about the KPZ equation, but that's another stochastic PDE where an, a precisely similar symmetry is what allows you to calculate the exponents exactly in one dimension. So if you have, if you can find uh, uh, symmetries like that, which are not, you know, just immediately visible on the face of the equation, then that can be very powerful. But no one's seen one for DP other than what I mentioned before, which is the time reversal symmetry. Uh, and that alone is definitely not enough to, to nail everything down. How? Well, I mean, this, this universality class does not have additive noise. Many do. Generally, if you have an absorbing state, you can't have additive noise because the noise has to vanish at the absorbing state. So it has to be nonlinear in, in the density. Yeah, because if the noise doesn't vanish in, as it, on, on approach to the absorbing state, you will just go past it and go to negative density. So, um, but there are many other universality classes where um, the noise is linear in the sense that nonlinear terms in the noise are irrelevant. By the way, if I go, if I mentioned this, if I go to, to um, the DP equation, but I take um, gamma one rho plus gamma two rho squared here, so I could easily have considered that noise, and this is irrelevant. In the sense that I said, and a reason, a way to see it is that it has a critical dimension of two. So that's yeah another example of something which vanishes at the critical point as I do the the RG flow. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's interesting because when I reversed the arrows, which I kind of said I did, well, yeah, the trouble is that the, the, the it, this is actually why it's a semi group. The procedure of eliminating degrees of freedom, like coarse graining and rescaling, which is zooming out, uh, cannot be inverted. I can't put in extra lattice sites and from the ones that I've got know what the what the occupation numbers are on those sites, if you know what I mean. Or in Fourier space, I can't uh, populate the the amplitudes of the Fourier modes beyond the cutoff, knowing the ones beneath it. So the actual construction of the normalization group only goes in, if you like, the wrong direction. And it was part of the genius of 
Wilson to say, well, if I know this map, I can just follow it the other way. So yeah, but you can't construct explicitly the the inverse map because you don't have the information there. Yeah. Okay, I'm exhausted. <laughs>